television rants about a rock star who died. The voice of a generation is silenced in suicide. Now they brand us with this X, a fallen cross we must bear. And they pass this mess off on us, cause it seems to them that we don't care. They just had this energy. There was such a, a, a passion for music and the, the kind of dialogue that was going on from instrument to instrument was just so palpable. I used to say Dave was one of the most talented people I, I had ever met. I mean, very, really talented. And the jazz sensibilities of Carter and Leroy particularly gave the band a sort of authority that a lot of other rock bands don't have. Rarely do you see someone blow up in that genre of music that fast. Because of the eclectic nature of the band, there's a little something in there for everybody. The Dave Matthews Band is a rare phenomenon in today's music scene. The band's reputation is founded almost entirely on their live shows, and with a fiercely loyal following, they have defied every idea of popular music, and have carved their own path and set their own standards. This is their story. Dave Matthews, the lead singer, was born in Johannesburg on January the 9th, 1967. Facing the prospect of time in the military, he relocated to Charlottesville, USA, where his father had once worked at the University of Virginia. Soon, Matthews' interest in playing the guitar and writing music took hold and was to be the beginnings of a unique and prosperous musical career. I think Dave is probably obviously the biggest personality in the band. Um, the times that I've hung out with Dave, he's been a very jovial and happy sort, and he comes off as a very, almost like an English country gentleman, sort of that he's very happy to, to have you at his house, and he's very gracious, and he would give you the shirt off his back. Um, but at the same time, he just, he's just happy to sit down and have a pint with you, too. He's a flirt. I mean, he's a flirt to, to everybody. I mean it in a sense where it's not necessarily sexual. It's one of those things where he... I think he flirts, kind of, he flirts with life. I was kind of mostly struck by his just charisma and his personality, which is just pretty overwhelming, really. It's hard not to, you know, it's hard not to like him, <laughs> you know, when you're around him. And, and I think that's a big part of his appeal. I go to L.A. and it's all, we're moving units, we're so excited, aren't you excited? How does it feel to be a star? We're, you know, and I'm just like, shut up! All the words you used in the last three sentences are nauseating. Yeah, Dave and I uh, really, really had a lot of fun together. He was, he was, we, be, we were actually became friends instantly, and and, and he's, he's such a friendly person, and, and we just, uh, we just enjoyed doing stuff. He was one of these people that, you know, it's, you know, there was, there was never any no, you know, I don't want to go do that, or I don't want to go do that. It was just like, and I'm sort of the same way. It was just like, yeah, well, let's go. So we would just kind of, kind of run off and, and just, just, you know, have fun together and just do these, like, bizarre, goofy, weird things that a lot of people would sort of have resistance to doing. My first impression of him was that uh, he was a very happy, very upbeat, um, very jovial kind of individual. He liked to kid around a lot, you know, sort of comical uh, personality. And then if there is a hell, I'll have a special place there. Not that I believe that there's a hell. But if there is one, you know, just in case. Just in case, you know, if that day when the when the Bigfoot lands on me or when a bus, I, I step out and don't look left, uh, that when I'm standing at the gates, if there are gates, that I can go, ha ha, yes, maybe I didn't believe in you, but look, I gave them a sandwich. He's very closely connected with his, his family, his sister and his mother especially. He's very close to them, and he's got a wonderful mother and a wonderful sister, you know, the two that I, the mother that I know, and, and the, uh, and the sister I knew, his other sister who had, had, uh, had died um, when his, right before his first album came out. I mean, he's obviously a very deep thinker, and, and he's had some terrible tragedies in his life. But he has a really likable personality, and he's just this happy, funny guy who is nice to everybody he sees, and you never you never meet anybody who's got a bad thing to say about Dave Matthews. So I remember when he got married, I mean, I think it was just like his mom, his sister, and, and just, you know, just family members, you know. So he's always had a real close connection with his mother. And, and, uh, and I think she's been a real big influence in a lot of ways 
as far as Dave being such a wonderful person that he is, because she is such a wonderful person. Members of the band, drummer Carter Beauford, bassist Stefan Lessard, saxophonist Leroy Moore and violinist Boyd Tinsley were already accomplished musicians and well established within Charlottesville's eclectic music scene. Uh, Leroy's, he's just a hometown boy, he's a good guy, very argumentative, he loves to, to get you in a bar and just argue you down about anything. Uh, Carter's a great guy, Carter's just the, the, the good guy in the whole bunch. And he's a very jovial sort in a sense that he has big sort of Dizzy Gillespie cheeks and he, and he enjoys a good laugh and he's probably the, the heart and soul of that band and, and I, I, when you see the band on stage you see Dave a lot of times connect with Carter because he's going off and he really holds that band together. It's very unintentional, all the mixing of music that we have. It's not like this clever, like, let's find, let's find a between ground, let's find a clinical look at it, let's find a, we need to find some space in between where it hasn't been touched at some golden point. No, it's, it hasn't, we haven't done that at all. We just sort of walked into a room together and went, uh, this is my song, oh, this is what I do, and, and then it's what came out because everyone is really, we like each other's music, we don't like the same music. But we do more and more respect each other's musical tastes. I think Boyd is the outrageous sort of one, you know, sort of the um, crazy. He's a really spectacular individual and it's super nice. And Boyd, like I said, is an, an incredible being. He used to show up and play fiddle at our parties all night and he's has a lot of great spirit and a great sense of humor. Stefan is the youngest sort of younger brother in the group and uh, He's, uh, he's an incredible bassist, but he's also very smart. And I know, you know he loves to read, and he's uh, quite the intellectual of the group. They knew what they were about. They felt that they had something and didn't know how big it would be, but were just going to follow it to its end. And obviously, at least in this country, it's, it's one, they're one of the biggest acts in the United States. Having met up on the Charlottesville bar music scene and Matthews instigating the formation of the band, together they played the local club and bar circuit. Before long, their musical talents had become recognized and would soon lead on to major international success. It happened very quickly here in Charlottesville. They were doing the weekly gig at Tracks. It was always very well attended. It was almost like a social event at first. Everybody went there because it was the place to go, but nobody really listened to the music that much. It was people just kind of mingling and talking to each other. And then at some point in the maybe year span that they did that, all of a sudden this show kind of took over and everybody started listening to the music and getting into that instead of it just being kind of like a party that you went to every week. In February 92, we did a cover story under the headline is the Dave Matthews Band the next big thing? And there's a, this great in-concert picture I took of Dave up on stage and Boyd Tinsley, and they just look like they're having a great time. And I was so reluctant to do, to do a story that asked if any particular band was the next big thing, but after seeing them, I got the impression that they stood a pretty good chance of being the next big thing. You know, I mean, would they go all the way? I think anyone who knows anything about the music industry knows that a lot of the most talented people don't go all the way. But would this be something that people all over could connect to? Absolutely, because you just felt it all around you. It was powerful, yeah. Next thing you knew that, you know, that Dave Matthews Band had, were starting to play shows in, in Charlottesville every Wednesday night and in uh, Richmond at the Flood Zone uh, every Tuesday night, and they were packed. And about that time is when they just started kind of taking off and they started playing bigger festivals and they started doing the West or the East Coast tour kind of thing and hitting Colorado and, and then within a, a year or two's time they had all kinds of major label interest and next thing we knew they were, they were big time radio stars. And within six months they were on MTV and uh, shooting to the top so the band sort of got in my impression early but they just moved very quickly. And I remember there was a certain point where 
where I had a big show down in North Carolina for like a week and I asked Dave if he wanted to come down. He sort of like at that point had to make a decision, you know, well, my band or this thing, you know. Not that he could have really done both, but he just was, you know, I think he felt obligated to his band and I think the band was doing, was, was just starting to do well and he saw a lot of potential in it and, and uh, so he ended up doing that. Uh, so, uh, but I remember one point he did tell me he was more excited and he was telling his girlfriend who was actually from, uh, from South Africa, he was more excited about telling her about working with me than he was about his band. But that was like, like before the band had even, you know, really gotten, gotten established and gotten going because he really I sort of enjoyed it. The same thing was very unusual for a lot of people because they didn't expect and a lot of people never, you know, you always grow up with these, you know, your idols and your, and your uh, you know, sort of role models. And then for your friend to become one of those, you know, it, it's sort of it's sort of a funny thing I think to experience, and uh, and uh, I was very happy for him. I thought it was great. In some contexts, you know, in other contexts, you sort of feel, you know, like you lost a friend because, you know, he's so busy. You know, which is understandable. Uh, you know, you you never hardly see him anymore. The Dave Matthews Band built their following from the grassroots by touring and performing live shows across Virginia and then throughout the US. This exposure was helped by extensive bootleg taping of their live performances and this was something that they actively encouraged. Although we didn't have any CDs out, kids were taping our music and, uh, and they were sending the tapes to their, to their friends and so after we were together for three years or so, uh, we'd go to places that we'd never been near, and all you know, kids would be singing the songs back to us. So it was really, it was a, it was strange, but but I, so I think that that was a lot of the reason that word spread about us. I think a lot of the reason is because kids were taping them, and and, uh, and so we still encourage it. The atmosphere at the Dave Matthews Band shows from the output from the start has always been helped and pushed on by a lot of beautiful young women. Uh, luckily in, in Virginia I don't think we have a, uh, a shortage of beautiful young women and for some reason they really tuned into this band and tuned into Dave's good looks and tuned into his music. And like I said the guys just followed wherever the girls would go and so a typical show of seeing the band early on would be you know Dave up on stage playing a couple lines of two-step coming in on the on a beautiful little guitar me melody and then seeing these hundreds of girls rush to the front of the stage screaming and yelling and uh, practically throwing their bras off on stage. The, the thing that strikes you the first time you see them, even back before they had any amount of polish or, or were even perhaps considering record label contracts, is they just had this energy. There was such a, a, a passion for music and the, the kind of dialogue that was going on from instrument to instrument was just so palpable that you just felt that and so as an audience member you almost felt like this extra member of the band you know this this kind of kinetic thing happening the thing that really struck me was the intense involvement on the part of the fans they knew all the songs they were very much into it predominantly younger people you know in their late teens twenties maybe early thirties at the oldest but they were into Dave probably only in a way that I'd seen people into the Grateful Dead. Yeah, I think he used a lot of his, you know, charming characteristics on stage, you know, and he was very funny and very personable. And he was very, I mean, that, that sort of whole thing with connecting with any and everybody. He didn't see people as, you know, as persons like that, and that person's like that, you know, he just, like, he just loved everybody. He just loves people, and that really showed. You know, having fun was probably one of his biggest motivations, and he just, He's a guy that just had fun every night when he played, and you, that's part of the, the natural ability that you see. Some people know how to capture the crowd, know how to project, and others just are, are not good in that role as a front man, you know, and bands usually need somebody with that kind of personality, and it seems like he had that very early on. It might be easy to stay, but it might I worked at a paper call, called the Seville Weekly here in Charlottesville, and my editor, Haas Spencer, uh, was trying to get some footage on the Dave Matthews band, and at the time I was selling advertising and writing a couple stories here and there for the band, and 
I found out that a friend of mine was the travel agent was who was in charge of sending the band out there, and, and they had an there was an extra plane ticket going to Vegas. That was the first time I've ever covered the band. I landed in Las Vegas, and I was staying at the MGM Grand right down the hall from the band. And it was ama what was amazing about that is that they were opening up for the Grateful Dead on a three-night stand. And this was in May 20th through 22nd, I believe, in 1993. And I asked Dave how they had gotten this gig, because up to this point, they had been playing 5,000, maybe 10,000 seat shows, but a lot smaller than that, definitely. And Dave told me that the, somebody had given uh, the manager of the Dead, uh, Dennis McNally, or the publicist, one of their CDs. And next thing you know, they got picked up and were opening up for the Grateful Dead. And I think that was important because at a Dead show, you get people that come from all over the country, all over the world. And there were 70,000 people. And there was another 30,000 people in the parking lot trying to get in. And they all heard Dave's music and they all heard who he was. And they probably all went out and bought it, the album the next day. But Dave's not a big guy for, for Vegas. I remember saying something to him about, I bet you're having a good time here. And he said, no, I'm just hanging out in my hotel room. I'm not much of a bright lights in a big city lab. You know, and I think it's kind of nice that this sort of small town kid, you know, and the guy that came out of Charlottesville and kind of just blown away to be opening up for the dead who have always been, you know, heroes of the bands, I'm sure. And, and, and I think rather than going out and celebrating like crazy in Vegas where there's plenty to do, you know, he was at home hanging out you know, with his girlfriend playing some music, and uh, it says a lot about Dave and a lot about who he is. Is that he's a real down-to-earth guy, and he's not—he's not a bunch of flash and glitter. I used to say Dave was one of the most talented people I, I had ever met. I mean, really, really talented, and uh, but really sort of aloof as far as you know, you know, like showing up and being on time and and whatnot. And uh, so I was sort of surprised in that context that he made it big because he was sort of aloof. And you know, I mean, a lot of times we had we were supposed to rehearse and he wouldn't show up. I'd go over to his house and he'd be still be in bed or something, you know. And, and uh, so, uh, no, but he was just, just, just oozing with, with talent. I mean, I've never, I don't think I've ever met anyone quite as talented as Dave, just, just all around in every context. The strange thing about Dave, I always thought, was uh, normally when you have that kind of natural ability, you, at 15 years old or 16, you just start writing songs. It just comes out of you. And he was a bartender, and gosh, I think he was probably 25 or so. I'm guessing, but you know, before he really said, "Hey, I think I can write songs," and you know, start doing it and getting this band together, and uh, it's just very odd for somebody that's that gifted to to wait that long. Playing guitar and studying with Tim Reynolds, I think he learned a lot from Tim Reynolds, and especially a lot of the lines that he plays um, are Tim Reynolds inspired. Uh, the way he plays guitar behind his, his singing, where it's more of a um, it's not so much of a vertical style, you know, with just chords, like holding a chord and strumming, but with, you know, kind of complex textures and lines and stuff. And the, that, uh, I think, is a big, comes from a Tim Reynolds type influence, probably. All of us just had gotten tired. Well, um, we'd worked on the project that we haven't yet finished. Um, it's been called the Lily White Sessions. Uh, we worked on that for about five months. You know, the first month was inspired. I think the band never sounded better. The second month, <clears throat> you know, was still dry, had a little momentum. But by the fifth month, it was, you know, I, you know, I hate me. I hate me. You know, just the, all of us was, it was just terrible. And so that really, that, that was sort of a low point for the band. Uh, and then going in, you know, when it went on tour for three months, and then going into the studio again with this challenge of coming up with something new, and, they, and every day was, you know, every day was, you know, 20 hours of work. It was really a <clears throat> wonderful experience. What impressed me when I saw the, the, the duo here of Tim and Dave was that they were very, very, very good guitar players. I didn't know how good they were until I saw them, and also the fact, and they worked together really well almost uh, almost telepathic and Dave's songwriting was not what I expected it was it had an unusual point of view 
Um, it was not the normal uh, or the average sort of music that we would hear, have here at the Birchmere or hear at the Birchmere, but it was powerful in a very different way from what is normally presented in the folk and bluegrass realm. In that regard, there was some cutting of new turf, if you will, and the crowd that was here was extremely into it. And Dave Matthews is someone who approaches the acoustic guitar very differently. He sees its, its percussive role and he plays it uh, what we would call closed. He, he plays a lot of arpeggio, muted strings. In other words, rather than letting each string ring out and sing open, he's got a finger on it, maybe the heel of his hand on, at the bridge. And what's happening is this, this very staccato, percussive thing, like what a band does. So then he brings in these marvelous jazz players, essentially, uh, you know, Carter Beaufort and Leroy Moore in particular, and now they're picking up on that sort of thing. And, you know, normally in a rock band, the, the, uh, the kick and the snare is sort of the heartbeat of a song. And in jazz, the pulse of the song is more on the hi-hat or the ride cymbal. So you take Carter's mentality of sort of moving where's the heartbeat of it, and then now you, you add that to this very eclectic approach to the acoustic guitar, and you've got this this real dance of percussive instruments. And uh, I like to think of their music as being like a, like a spider walking in that um, rather than one player stepping out and taking a solo in the tradition of the jam, uh, it's like each member is doing something that's contributing to the other. And so you don't even notice the movement of the band as it just keeps going forward as each is supporting the other. And I think that's, that's what was so fresh and unique, especially at in the early 90s. And bringing in the jazz sensibilities of Carter and Leroy particularly gave the band a sort of authority that a lot of other rock bands don't have because those guys definitely have chops. <laughs> you know that anybody in the local jazz scene can attest to around here and there's a strong jazz tradition in Charlottesville. Charlottesville really is a strong jazz town and it's often called a strong bluegrass town but it really isn't that. It's always been sort of a dead zone for bluegrass but uh, it really has a, a vibrant sort of jazz scene and they were two of the monsters. So those guys have definitely given it a grounding that's very important. And, you know, Stefan just anchors everything on the bass really well. And what really set the band apart to me, other than uh, Dave's great, you know, looks and uh, his voice, was Carter Beaufort's drums. And I think with, when he came into the band, it really solidified what was already a pretty good kind of a jug band outfit and sort of a get together and play on, you know, a couple occasions and sort of work with Dave's uh, lyrics. But when Carter came in, uh, it seemed to me, I mean, he's the best drummer I've ever heard in my life. And when you hear Dave's music, I think the drums are where a lot of people will walk away with saying, wow, now that is a virtuistic uh, drum player. I'm a fan of, of the, the band's textures and in particular what Carter does on the drums. I, I, I think Carter's influence in modern rock is something that hasn't really been explored, but you can't hear a drummer on American radio today who hasn't stolen his brass work and what he does on the cymbals. That's a, that's, a, that's a sneaky legacy, but a powerful one. In 1991, keyboardist Peter Greiser joined the Dave Matthews Band, but by early 1993, he'd quit. Greiser's departure was abrupt and happened at the cusp of the band's major success. Even so, many have felt that he has left an indelible musical imprint on the Dave Matthews Band music. I first met Peter Greiser at Miller's Bar probably back in uh, early 1992, 93. And Peter had just left the Dave Matthews Band after playing with them for almost two and a half, three years. And at the time, uh, it kind of drew some attention around town. Peter has always been known as the guy who left the Dave Matthews Band. He's the Pete Best of the Beatles. A lot of people don't understand why somebody like that would leave the band right before they got big. And Peter probably doesn't doesn't like me speaking uh, for him. But after you know managing Peter for for a year and working with him for a couple years on my record label, I know that probably more than anything, one of the reasons Peter left the band was to do his own thing. And I know that he loves the band with all his heart, and he's still best friends with all the guys in the band, but I think Pete really felt that he had his own thing to do. He had his own sound and his own music. He was a young college kid, and they had this group. And I think the transition into a somewhat traveling 
band was kind of hard for him. I mean, he was in school. He was, you know, he did all these things. And, and uh, I know he helped write a lot of songs. You know, he's a great songwriter. Peter Greiser seems pretty comfortable with himself, but he did leave right before this thing went stratospheric. So he's got to think about that. Some people see that as, you know, a great misstep in, in, in his life. Certainly if he had stayed with the band, his life would be very different than it is today. But I tell you what, Peter is the happier and probably the happiest guy I've ever met in my life. He's quite content to be, uh, to be doing his thing. The contemporary Charlottesville music scene gave the Dave Matthews Band a variety of live venues to perform at on a regular basis and gave them the chance to develop their songs, lyrics and style. The band's reputation as the hottest live act in the area began to grow and before long a Dave Matthews Band show was a major local event. Taylor Emery was heavily involved in the scene at the time. This is 100 West South Street and uh... This is the, the site of the Pink Warehouse, which was immortalized in song uh, by the Dave Matthews Band and, and the aptly named song called Warehouse. And uh, it's basically a, a pink warehouse that uh, used to be at one point a, a textile warehouse, I believe. And back in uh, the early 1990s, I think it was 1991, must have been early 1991, the Dave Matthews Band played their first ever show as a full unit on the roof of this building. And uh, I believe, uh, I think it was uh, Haynes lived up there. There was a fellow lived up there and he had a party and the band came and uh, they got about a couple hundred people up on the stage, up on the roof. And uh, the band played uh, all night long. The uh, focal point and the beginning, I guess, the beginning place of every uh, Dave Matthews and Charlottesville tour is Miller's. Miller's is the famous bar where Dave got his start in the, as a dishwasher of all things else. He was such a good dishwasher that they made him a bartender. And before long, he was even playing on the tiny stage in there with Peter Greiser and uh, Boyd. And this was the place where the band really, really gelled. This is the uh, essential meeting place for a lot of musicians in Charlottesville. And you could say the band you know, got their start here even though the stage is so small, you'd be hard pressed to fit them all on the same stage. But they did a lot of shows here with only a couple of them at one time. And Peter and Dave played here a lot. And this, uh, this place has been immortalized uh, in the new album, Busted Stuff. Dave has a song called Bartender. And it's all about his bartending days here at, at Miller's. One of the ways I first heard of Dave Matthews was we ran a story about Charlottesville bartenders. And the writer remarked on all the craziest bartenders and how they treat their customers, etc. And Dave was known for basically turning Miller's into his own little theatrical box where he was putting on a show while tending bar. And this was, you know, this was a story we ran I think in 1990, long before there was a hint of a band. I don't think he did any dishwashing, although he may have been drafted into doing so. Yeah. A competent worker. Yeah. He resigned. He's not one of those who were separated. He resigned because he had to devote more time to his music. This is the salad area. And uh, mentioning that David left his mark on Miller's, uh, this is it here. The other guys, uh, they come by frequently too. Uh, their mothers live in town. And uh, frequently doing that. One of the good things the guys did was buy homes for their mothers, which I thought was wonderful. This is the Eastern Standard, also S Cafe now. Eastern Standard is uh, really part of the Dave Matthews Band folklore because uh, Dave and Peter Greiser got their start here on open mic nights. Uh, before anybody would let Dave Matthews play on their stage, Sean at uh, Eastern Standard did. And uh, it was an open mic night. It was just the guys sitting down and making up stories and making up songs as they went along. But I think you'd be surprised how many 
songs came out of those sessions and how much early work the, the band playing on an open mic night for a couple people here at, at a restaurant really did for the band. But for the Dave Matthews and for his start, it really started right here. Miller's might have been a focal place for the band, but Dave and Peter really got together and started making music right here. The manager of Eastern Standard called over and said, could you change our calendar listing for Tuesday nights to say Dave Matthews Band? And I said, Dave Matthews Band? That, that kid's an actor. What do you, what's going on here? And he said, he's got a new band. Please list us. So we listed him. And I sort of forgot about him for a while until an intern in our office contacted me and said, we've got to do a big story on this band, this phenomenal new band, Dave Matthews Band. And I said, you know, bands come and go, and you want me to do a cover story, which would be, you know, wasting all of our capital, our political capital, on what might be just a fly-by-night phenomenon. And he said, no, no, you got to come down on Tuesday nights at tracks and see this band. So I came down, and they were good. This is Trax. Trax is uh, the infamous nightclub where the Dave Matthews Band played every Wednesday night for two or three years. Uh, Corin bought into the club some point in the early 1990s, and so, of course, he got the band to play there as often as they could, and the show started off with maybe 20, 25 people and ended up with hundreds of people. Probably topping out around four or 500 people in there, uh, and when the fire department uh, came in uh, maybe a little bit less to kick half the people out, but it's kind of a sad story as uh, Trax is set to be torn down. And it's really, uh, if you can imagine, a lot of people are pretty upset about this and the way that they're losing a part of their history. Um, it's kind of a, a shitty little club. It was a pretty crappy little club for a long time. It was dark, it smelled, it was dank, there's beard all over the floors, you know, but it was ours, you know, and it was the only thing that we had. And uh, it was dirty and dank, but the band really, really became a unit here. Really tightened up, and, uh, and these shows that they played every week really made the band, you know, the unit that they are now. Corin Capshaw was uh, managing the club in Charlottesville called Trax that I booked a lot of uh, my bands into, and uh, I talked to Corin all the time to book my acts. And uh, the he called me one day and he said, "There's this." kid down here named Dave Matthews and he said he's the most natural performer I've ever seen and uh, you got to check him out so uh, I did and he was right and I, there was a club in DC called the Bayou that he used to play all the time a little 500 seater and uh, I remember the first couple times honestly that I saw him I didn't quite get it because he, he was so different you could see that his natural performing ability but he was so different that it was a sound I'd never heard. And then the more you got into it, uh, and the, after I'd seen him a couple times, I just was, I said he's the best thing I've ever seen since I've been in the music business. See, I went down skeptical, and I left puzzled, because I didn't absolutely love him. But clearly, this was a band that had already created a nice little following in the small town of Charlottesville, Virginia. And the funny thing was, is the, the intern who had said, we've got to do a big story on Dave Matthews Band, his story was amazingly prescient. It said, perhaps one day, 1992, will be remembered as the year the Dave Matthews Band played at tracks. Sort of like the Beatles in Hamburg, or Jim Morrison at the Whiskey in LA, or one of these classic memories. And sure enough, that's what happened. Uh, I would say the climax of the Dave Matthews tenure over tracks uh, was in 1993 when they had the CD release party for Under the Table and Dreaming here. It was quite an event. Uh, hundreds of people showed up, including uh, all these RCA bigwigs from Los Angeles and uh, whatnot that we're not used to seeing in Charlottesville. You could tell them because they all had the nice suits on and uh, everybody else just had on a t-shirt. But uh, 
That was the day that uh, Dave Matthews got the key to the city from Mayor David Toscano, and uh, it was named Dave Matthews Day in the city of Charlottesville. And it was funny because that was a number of years ago, and that was right when the band was just getting started. Their video had just gotten played on MTV, and nowadays, if, that, if they gave them the key to the city then, they ought to probably just give them the city now, you know what I mean? Because uh, it certainly could come a lot further. At some point, we got a call saying that uh, that they were kind of that Dave was getting tired of playing, you know, so regularly with the band, and, and really wanted to do something on his own, a little bit more intimate, you know, and, and uh, in a listening environment, which is, of course is what the Prism is kind of all about. And it's just all about creating an environment just to listen to music. And so, uh, I knew I'd known that he wanted to play here for quite some time, so I was really open to the idea, you know. It was a very nice, intimate atmosphere. Um, yeah, when Dave first played here, it was, uh, well, actually, every time he played here, it was just very quiet and respectful, and I remember people singing along with the songs quite a bit, you know, even then, uh, which was, I think, maybe before Remember Two Things had come out, so it was pretty early, and still everybody knew the words to his songs, you know, it was pretty amazing. The Birchmere and Charlottesville were the only places they did the acoustic show until it got to a point where there were some markets that the band could not afford to go to and the acoustic duo was a way to go into markets and cities that they couldn't afford to go to with a band anymore because the band just got too big. Well, when they showed up, it was I was surprised because it was Corin and Tim, the guitar player, and Dave, and I seemed to recollect that was about it, and they just set up on their own and tuned the guitars and did their show. It was not, uh, there was no pretension about it or anything along those lines. They just did their gig and were very nice, very pleasant guys. They weren't ostentatious, they weren't peculiar, <laughs> no heavy lifting and uh, just did the set and knocked the crowd out. It was, what, what impressed me was how, already how devoted and um, raucous, if you will, in their uh, appreciation of Dave it was the crowd that night. In 1992, the Dave Matthews Band were only playing to a handful of people at local Charlottesville bars. Though after their international success, the band returned in 2001 as local heroes and played to a home's welcome at the town's largest venue, Scott Stadium. There had been rumors for years they were going to come back and play in Charlottesville. And finally, last year they did. They came back and played uh, Scott Stadium at the University of Virginia uh, with Neil Young opening for them. So it's a big difference from the days they were playing at tracks and nobody was listening to them really. It was kind of just social event milling around drinking beer. So Neil Young opening for the Dave Matthews. Band. So here we are, there are 50,000 people that have come into our little burg. And the town is 50,000 strong. So we pretty much doubled in size for this weekend. People from all over the world have come to hear this concert. It's in our stadium, our football stadium, that has just grown in this massive proportions to accommodate these people. And it was really spectacular to go there, to be able to see the rotunda that um, part of the university, Jefferson's University, um, in, in the background, and be able to hear, hear this man stand there and say, I'm really quite nervous about this. He was so open and honest and so willing to be vulnerable in that moment and say, I'm very nervous about playing in front of my hometown, very nervous. These are the people that I most care about and this is not the same as going you know, to Boston or some random place. This, this is my family, these are my people and I, I just want, I hope I do a good job for you all. And the crowd just ate it up. album, Remember Two Things, released in 1993, it had climbed high in the college radio chart, which brought interest from many major labels. 
Eventually, a contract was signed with RCA Records, and by the following year, in 1994, their debut album, Under the Table and Dreaming, had finally made its imprint across the US. You know, well, the, the first record before RCA picked them up was called Remember Two Things, and it was done by my friends John Alasia and Doug Derryberry. Um, they really tried to capture the sense of what the band was doing live. In fact, that record begins with about 45 seconds of just a snare hit, which critics immediately are sort of like, what? You know, and certainly commercially, that's, I mean, that's, that's a great way not to sell records. But I know what John was trying to do was communicate that there is such a power in this music. Um, but I think one thing that you, you've seen from that record uh, on through the records is they've, uh, Dave himself, has had a really maturing sense of what the song is and uh, the importance of song structure and, and you just see that growth gradually uh, in what the band's been doing. In the past we sort of road tested a lot of songs, or we've not road tested them and said these are going to be on the album. We've gone into the studio armed with 30 songs or 50 songs or whatever that, and so going in the, it, was, it, wasn't, it was not frightening, you know. Uh, whereas this time we, we went in with, so we didn't know how they were going to do. And it was actually a great sounding little CD. I mean, it sounded like it was professionally done. It didn't have that local sound to it at all. So we actually started playing a couple of songs. We played Satellite and Trip and Billy's off of that disc. And uh, we got so many requests for them, they became very popular. They would play around town and they uh, actually came into the station a couple of times and, and would just talk to us a little bit before one of their weekly gigs, trying to get people to come out and see them, something they don't have a problem with now at all. Early on, I thought Dave's first few albums especially um, he still writes great lyrics, but he really had some deep stuff back in the beginning and people were so eager just to, to lump him into uh, being a jam band and uh, I saw him as, as so much more than that. I mean, there, there are only a few people in the music business, I think, that can marry great lyrics and, and uh, melody and a dance beat all together. And they're probably, you know, Sting, Peter Gabriel and Dave. And there are probably a few others, those are the first three that come to mind, but it, when you can marry all three of those elements together, I think you're, you're just, you know, you're guaranteed success. I think Under the Table and Dreaming, the first record on RCA, which came out in 94, um, is, is wonderful for an old fan because you saw sort of the best of all worlds. You, you, you could still see the seeds of what was happening here in Charlottesville in the early 90s, but you, you also could see them growing into a band that was ready to, to stand on a, a national and even international stage with some prominence. Um, certainly, uh, anthemic songs like Ants Marching are, are popular. Uh, I love Satellite because it really showcases what Dave does on the acoustic guitar so interestingly. I think the uh, Under the Table and Dreaming continues to be the one that people have in their CD players. Their consequent four albums, Crash, Before These Crowded Streets, Every Day and Busted, demonstrated confidence and a maturity in their musical development. With sales entering into the hundreds of thousands, they have pitched themselves as one of the top US bands of the past decade. You know, another funny thing about the band is they reuse songs a lot on their albums, so it's almost, um, it's not like they, they may have X number of albums, but do they really? In the early days, the lyrics uh, and the style of music were very similar to the way they are now. Actually, a lot of the songs that have come out on all of their albums had their seeds in their weekly shows at tracks. They actually started playing those songs then, and the arrangements have changed, of course, and they still have changed their arrangements from one show to the next, kind of, sometimes. But uh, a lot of those songs were written originally by the band in the first couple of years, and uh, they've just been kind of polishing them throughout the years, and you never know what you're going to see. Uh, there's a bunch of songs they used to play at, at tracks and around town that you still haven't been released on albums, but any day now they could be out there. In the early days um, with the Dave Matthews band, I think the, the sound core of what, of what you hear today is, was, was really evident then as well. A lot of the biggest hits of the band have been from the songs that they wrote in the beginning. Um, you know, one big difference was uh, Peter Greiser was playing keyboards and he helped shape a lot of the songs. And when he left, some of the songs left with him. 
Personally, I really like Crush. <laughs> um, it just was big. It just sounded big to me. And, um, it was really nice to, it got me through personal moments uh, for myself. And um, I remember listening to it one day on this really horrible rainy day. I was driving back from Lynchburg and, uh, and it, I just listened to it the whole way there and the whole way back. It really just got me through an um, emotionally tough time. I was having some family crisis and, uh, and I got in here and I was at the counter and Boyd came up, ordered his normal drink and I just pulled him aside and said, I just have to tell you that you, know, you just got me through a really tough time and I really appreciate it and if nothing else, and that's the kind of contribution you're making. And I think that really made, you know, I mean, he was very appreciative of that. When the band matured and put out Crash, to me, I thought, I think Steve Lillywhite's production work on that album is second to none. And when you look at some of Lillywhite's other albums, you know, U2's Unforgettable Fire, and, and, and you listen to an album like that, and then you listen to Dave Matthews' band's Crash, there's, there's a really capturing of the essence of what, of what the band is on, on that album. The imagery that is, uh, comes out of that, is, is very powerful and obviously the band did great on MTV. They had a number of great videos with Crash and So Much To Say and Too Much and it all just keeps on going and going. And a, the band, you know, received a Grammy for the song So Much To Say off of, uh, off of Crash and I think that says a lot, you know, they, they really, they really deserve it. I mean, from one, one year they're just a small little local band here in Charlottesville and three years later they've got a Grammy under their belt and they're touring, you know, getting ready to tour a huge stadium. I think there's a thing for anybody, you, you tend to have a, a favorites that you listen to over and over and over and then you, you tend to move on. Dave has found whole new audiences of, of new younger people as he's gotten older and I know a lot of his fans were very disappointed when he, when he stopped working with Steve Lillywhite. I think then on his new Unbusted stuff he's returned more to his, his roots and you know collaborating with the band and, um, and the result I think is a better record than he's made in a few records. Every day of the last album uh, I was working for the fan club when it came out and so it's the first very electric album. But I mean, the album always had great sales. It was just people, it's, it's one of those things, if something changes, people will always be hesitant. Well, that's my band, that's not what they do, that's not what they do, that's, yeah. And then I think now people, once you listen to it a few times, you get into that mode of listening to some A lot of people love to criticize every day because they know it was concocted and, 10 or 12 days and they know Glenn Ballard is a hit maker and they know that there was an effort to get a little bit more commercial radio play. But having said that, there's some pretty nice songs on there that over time no one will ever remember that this was the commercial album. Maybe they'll remember, but I don't think it'll it won't have teeth, that criticism. I think the, the arc of their growth from album to album has been very gradual um, until you got to every day. And then I know a lot of old school Dave fans are not as excited about that record, but I think for Dave Matthews artistically, it was probably a good opportunity to work with someone like producer Glenn Ballard and really think about songs as, as, as finite structures as opposed to songs in the context of a live band show. Uh, so I, I don't know, if you're a fan, you're willing to watch them grow and support that growth and, and learn from that growth and learn from their steps and missteps. I think, I think they're, the original songs that, that Dave and Ross Hoffman worked on are similar to the most recent work. And I think they're all good. There's never been a bad album but there's also never been one that stands out as being the classic. One factor that set the Dave Matthews Band apart musically from most other popular bands is the diverse use of instruments. Beaufort's varied drum kit, Tinsley's acoustic and electric violins, 
Lessard's electric bass, Moore's saxes, horns and flutes, and Matthew's acoustic guitar and lead vocals, pitches a unique sound in the world of rock music. Ross Hoffman, who is uh, sort of a local, local songwriter and musician and also sort of, uh, he, he was amused to Dave for a long time and he really sat down with Dave and, and encouraged Dave to, to put pen to paper and write the songs and to where to expand upon them and where to stop and, encur and would read Dave's stuff and, and give him feedback. I think that was a huge influence uh, to Dave and I think his collaborator, collaborators all the way along the line with, with the rest of the band and with Peter and with you know, John Durth and you know, these, just as many talent, Greg Howard, the many talented people in this town, I think really gave Dave a big hand along his way and, and, and encouraged him and helped shape his music to what it is. Yeah, I don't think that there's any, uh, any group of people that affected me more than the Beatles, uh, at least musically. And, uh, uh, you know, it's sad that, that, we, that everything moves on and that people roll over, you know. But uh, we could all hope to have his life, near, a life nearly as full as George Harrison. So uh, I think he, he left a beautiful mark here and we should be grateful for that and celebrate his passing. Dave's South African roots affect his sense of melody and his approach to the guitar. I think more than anything, you have to understand the Dave Matthews Band as a product of <clears throat> five different voices having a conversation, each with something to say, but coming from a very different perspective. And so when you bring that all together, you get something that's, that's unique. And you can't say, oh, well, Dave Matthews was clear, the band was clearly influenced by this band or that band, because it's such an amalgam of, of so many influences that each player brings to the table. Uh, it's a very specific genre, even today. I think it started that way as well. Um, it's sort of this fusion of jazz, and David uses his voice as its own instrument, um, and um, so you actually get this other instrument in there as well. It's just, it's, it's a really fresh sound, and I think even still it is, even though there are a number of bands that are uh, sounding a little more like them every day. To me, it's contemporary rock that reflects the burgeoning of alternative music, but they're still, it's rooted in contemporary rock and roll, or the traditional rock and roll. Uh, there's jazz improvising that's in it, if only because of the instruments in the band. Um, so to me, I would put him in a contemporary rock category with uh, jazz overtones. I don't, I don't think it fits into a genre. Um, I, I think it's sort of made its own genre. It's also uh, allowed some maybe different influences to slip under the pop rock mainstream umbrella uh, that maybe couldn't have if, if uh, you know your, your uh, demographic taste testers don't approve and here's this band d n break, breaking all the rules the songs are too long you know the, the, there aren't as many hooks as in traditional pop music uh, it's more about the musicianship and yet they've managed to to call out a, a following College town of some 50,000, Charlottesville is a laid-back city of green lawns and tree-lined avenues, and a place where the band have stayed true to. They have all bought houses in the area, and have continued to give back to local worthwhile causes. The band has really stayed true to Charlottesville. I think you see them here all the time, walking around the street, and they're not, they haven't run off to other parts of, of the world, but uh, the fellas got their start here in this town, and, and they've stuck around and uh, put a lot back into the, into the town. You probably know about Bama Works, which is the Dave Matthews Band um, charitable organization, and, and they've raised literally millions of dollars and given it to important causes, not just in the Charlottesville area, but, but elsewhere. And so I, I think that sense of responsibility and generosity is something that their music communicates, and, and that's just another reason why you feel connected to it as a listener. White sands head love. He has um, given money to um, uh, local nonprofits, uh, Discovery Museum, that bike program uh, for the city, uh, a bunch of money towards a, a local park so that they could expand it and develop it. 
And that Dave, as far as I know, has been one of the most generous rock stars that I can think of, you know, in terms of really helping out the community, you know, with um, projects that, that needed, you know, help. In the mid-90s, one day, uh, when the museum was closed to the public, which is every Monday, uh, Dave Matthews just knocked on the door, came in the museum, and handed me a check. And I never think it's look, nice to look at money when somebody hands you money, but I did, and it was more zeros than I'd, anybody would ever walked in and given me, and that was personally, he did that. And, it's, an, it's any nonprofit director's dream to have somebody unsolicited come in and give you money. There wouldn't be much of the community in Charlottesville that hasn't been touched by it with Dave Matthews Band's generosity. And that's for a long time, long before it was public, when they didn't used to list that they were the benefit, they were the, the donors. So they didn't do it. I never felt that they did it to get recognition. They did it because they felt good about sharing um, their success with the community that they felt strongly about. The Dave Matthews Band has made it, with millions of records sold, platinum albums, and with many sold out tours under their belts. But what about the future of the band? And will they continue in the business if they ever split? I would say the operative word in Dave Matthews' band is band, and that comes across in their live shows. And I think when you see their graphics, any picture of them, uh, if you didn't know who Dave Matthews is, you wouldn't know uh, from the picture because he's not front and center. Um, he, it's a band. Dave admitted early on that his musicianship was nothing compared to these guys. But Dave wrote the songs, and those are good songs. And Dave brought those guys together, and that's a good group. And so, just as Dave recognizes that Corin is an astute business person, I think the band members recognize that Dave is the spark that made it all happen. And to, to get upset that he's got his name on it. You know, that's, 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 that's still more good business, actually, because what, what could be better for a band than having a nice guy fronting it? If you can't, the only thing better than a nice guy is a hot babe. And I don't think that would be consistent with this band. <laughs> No, I, I remember someone made a comment, Boyd or whatever, one of, the, one of the other musicians said, Dave doesn't need us. And I think it's true in the context. I mean, he can go off and play solo gigs by himself, and I think it really, because none of those guys were really that successful before they, they had, had, um, had uh, started working with Dave. I mean, they were all, I think they were all very good musicians, but I think Dave brought in that sort of creative, very unique sound that um, I think that made them so successful. I don't think any one of them will ever have a solo career of any note. And that's not to criticize them, it's just to say that good musicianship on its own is not enough. You have to have that spark, the songs. By 2002, the Dave Matthews Band were at the height of their abilities. A guaranteed concert draw and a major album chart act. They have carved their own path and set their own standards. This sort of blend of, of jazz and rock and pop is so innovative that nobody does what they do. There are people who try to, to get that sound, but people don't understand. It's, it's not a saxophone like Clarence Clemens playing with the E Street Band on the saxophone. And uh, you, you see a lot of really um, aggressive, busy drummers but not drummers who are supporting the intricate guitar figures the way Carter does. And um, it's a unique thing. And I think it's about uh, five guys who listen to each other. No one really knows what makes a hit record or what makes a band succeed. You can have all the business components together. You can be proficient in your music. That still doesn't say that it's going to engage an audience, sell records, and do both of those for an extended period of time. Um, 
just sometimes uh, that magic happens where an audience and an artist meets and it grows exponentially from there. And it's as simple as that. Uh, I think Dave has been successful uh, because he has fun what he's doing and he's got a really deep well of songwriting talent and Korn has done a really good job managing him. They did the hard work early on and that was probably the most important thing. I think they're so successful because they write really good songs uh, and because of the eclectic nature of the band there's a little something in there for everybody. There's nothing that's really offensive to anybody. I mean, it's not like hard wailing guitars. It's very listenable music, and Dave writes very good lyrics, very introspective lyrics, I think. The kind of success that they've had proves that you can make it from the ground up, and you just have to have a, a vision and follow it, and uh, if you're good enough and unique enough, you can succeed, and they're the proof of that. With a constantly changing and developing style, a unique fusion of sounds together with five individuals who complement each other in a magical way, there is no doubt that their success will continue. One in every 250 people in America has a record. So then it made it different from saying, well, you've sold a million albums or you sold them. But I thought, that's, that's pretty haunting, actually. That kind of makes me paranoid. But that's okay, I'm meant to be paranoid. Aren't you meant to be paranoid if you... If, a, if one in every 100, 250 people have your record or know you, then you should be paranoid. Because they know you. Yeah, because they know you. You know, walking around like that, so that's okay. The television rants about a rock star who died the voice of a generation is silenced in suicide. Now they brand us with this X, a fallen cross we must bear. And they pass this mess off on us, cause it seems to them that we don't care.